Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Beauty History. I am your host, Allison Chase. Beauty History is where we take a deep dive into the history, life, and legacy of a fashion or beauty icon. So for today's episode, I have a little surprise for you that I will show in a few minutes and just a little bit of light housekeeping first. So uh, I apologize for my absence last month. There is normally a new episode the first Friday of every single month, but last month I was on vacation in Portugal. So there was no episode, so apologies for that. But there's a new episode the first Friday of every month otherwise. And I wanted to bring something to your attention. If you look at the bottom of the screen where it says subscribe, like, dislike, etc., there is now a thanks button. This allows you to thank me, the creator, in the form of a monetary tip. So if ever you've enjoyed this series, if you'd like to encourage me, to support me, to send me a thanks for all the research and writing that I do, consider leaving a thanks. Now, for today's episode, we will be talking about Thomas Burberry. Yes, the Burberry brand. But we have a little surprise that I want to show for you who watch, because I know a lot of you who watch this watch every single episode. So I decided to come out with my very own beauty history bingo card. I know it's a little bit cheesy but I think it's kind of cute. So there's a link below for you guys to go ahead and download and print off your very own beauty history bingo card. Feel free to follow along. Um, I, I put a couple items in here that I personally remember mentioning a whole lot across several episodes, but if there are any topics, any phrases, any people that you remember a lot, please uh, leave a comment below. I can go ahead and modify this for next time. So uh, you can go ahead and play this one today and see how many we get. I'm not sure. I won't go ahead and spoil anything, but if you feel up to it, you can go ahead and rewatch some older episodes with this here and you may get a full bingo card. You might. So anyway, that's the little surprise for you today. Now that that is all out of the way, I hope you enjoyed the bingo card. Let me know what you think in the comments before we go any further. Let's take a second to grab our iced coffee or a hot coffee. Let's take a sip and let's get started. Now, Burberry, what a, a British brand. I can't think of any more iconic British company than Burberry. Now this started with a man, Thomas Burberry. He was born August 27th, 1835 in a village called Brockham Green, which is in the district of Surrey. Fun fact, this village, Brockham Green, actually is dated back in the history books in 1241. So it's quite a, an ancient village, you know, a little hamlet. Thomas was educated at the local village school, the Brockham Green Village School. You know, I'm thinking a one-room classroom. And unfortunately, I don't have tons of personal details about Thomas Burberry. I found different sources that said that his father was a farmer and a grocer, but I think we can assume that he grew up very, apologies, very much uh, working class, middle class. He was educated, which does give us some indication that, you know, he wasn't destitute by any means. He was able to get an education. After his education at the local village school, he became an apprentice at a draper's shop. So when I heard the word draper, I thought drapes like curtains. No, no. Draper at the time meant that someone was selling or manufacturing a fabric for clothing. So he was, uh, this draper was someone who made clothing essentially for people. So Thomas did an apprenticeship at this retailer to learn how to make clothing, how to dress people. But really from an early start, Thomas was an entrepreneur and he knew right away that he wanted to start his own shop, his own business. And so he did so actually quite young. In 1856, at the age of 21, Thomas Burberry opened his shop in a village called Basingstock. And this place actually at the time only had about 
4,500 people. So it was a very small village, a hamlet, well, maybe more of a village or small parish here. And he started his business right away. He wasn't interested in working for other people for a very long time. Something to note is across various different beauty history episodes that we've covered, a lot of people start off wanting to dress kings and queens and nobility. We, we've seen this a lot, you know, people start off and they initially, immediately start off luxury and they only want to do the best of the best for the very best. But this is completely opposite of Burberry. So Thomas Burberry was interested in dressing um, fishermen, people that went hunting. He was interested in dressing shepherds. The type of clothing that Burberry initially made was like outdoor sportswear for someone enjoying the rugged outdoors, spent laborers, people who spent their entire days working the fields, working outside. He was not interested in dressing fancy pants. He was not interested in making fine, delicate goods. He was making, or it was, you know, always innovating and trying to make weather resistant, weatherproof material. And that's what he was, what he was doing. He was dressing the common man. He was dressing the field laborer. Also something that sets Burberry apart from a lot of the other brands that we've mentioned is Burberry started off with clothing. A lot of the brands that we've discussed started off with leather goods, suitcases, small leather goods, or hats, or whatever, and then they eventually made clothing. Perfumes sometimes. No, no. Burberry started off dressing the common man. That's what they were doing. What's interesting is that his initial shop in Basingstock, this town only had 4,500 people, but his shop there was very successful. Considering the population, he actually, because I guess he was dressing the common folk and there was a lot of working class, middle class people at the time, he was quite successful because he was just dressing the neighbors, the, the neighbors, the laborers, the shepherds, etc. So he actually was quite successful in his own right from the beginning. And he was constantly trying to innovate things because he was an entrepreneur and because he was dressing people working outside, you know, this is lots of harsh weather, it's cold, it's hot, it's rainy, it's muddy. So he was constantly trying to find innovations and make better fabric because, you know, he was not only making the clothing, but he was playing around with the different fabrics to try to make them more resistant and, you know, tougher to elements. Now, like I said, I don't have a lot of personal details about Thomas Burberry. I don't know what type of cheese he liked, but I do have access to census records. I feel like finding census records for these episodes is like dumpster diving for information. I'm like, Inspector Alley off to find some details. So according to census records, by 1861, Thomas was employing seven men, seven women, and three children. I guess this predates labor laws, specifically child labor laws. But, you know, after a few years, his shop was doing well. He had uh, quite a few employees. And what's interesting is you know, to have employees, you need to have income to pay them. Again, this is, this I think predates some labor laws. So I don't know how much people are getting paid, but enough to, you know, keep them going. So I find that in itself quite impressive. So Thomas Burberry eventually started partnering with British cotton manufacturers because as I stated, he was constantly dressing, you know, the common folk, the laborers. And so this partnership allowed him to keep experimenting with different fabrics and blends just to be able to create something a bit more weatherproof. So the first census quote was 1861. Now we have a second census from 1871, so a decade later. By this time, he was employing 70 people, seven zero. That is like the graph was like going up, 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 like off the charts again. And like, can you imagine paying the salaries of 70 people? That's a lot of people. Like that's a lot of success. Just goes to show like just making like good quality, nothing fancy, n not trying to, 
you know, dress emperors or empresses, just trying to dress the common folk was, you know, a really great idea because it was so successful. The census uh, quoted said that Thomas Burberry was a draper and manufacturer employing 70 hands. I don't know how many of those were children. Maybe the laws changed by that point, but again, he was just doing really well, so good for him. And by this point, by 1871, oops, sorry, by 1871, Thomas was doing so well that he was able to buy this estate in Basingstock for his family. This estate had 160 acres of land. That's a lot of land. And he, there he uh, hired an entire staff, servants, maids, you know, living on the premise. I'm, I'm sort of thinking of Downton Abbey, but not quite to that extent because Downton Abbey was like a whole castle, but basically the Burberries were doing well. They had this, I mean, 160 acre plot of land. So maybe not quite like Downton Abbey, but like, you know, not that far off. Just think of a huge estate, huge grounds, like how many people it would take, you would need to employ to make sure the grounds are maintained and kept and how many people you would have to hire to live in your home to maintain that. By 1878, he moved to a larger factory and started focusing on wholesale manufacturing, not just the clothing, but just like on a larger scale, just like trying to expand. And then I have another census, the 1881 census, claimed that by that point, Thomas Burberry had six children. And it's also stated that by 1881, he was employing over 200 people at his factories. 200 people, that's a lot of people. Wow, that's a lot of salaries. And his six children were being educated by a governess. Now, a governess is not really a term we use that often anymore. So a governess was a woman who was charged with educating privately a family or children anyway. So what she would do is she was a teacher and a governess would go to your home and live in your home. Like she was live in help basically, but her whole job was just educating your children. So it was like having your very own private tutor that lived with you. Uh, I think there must have been private schools by this point. Clearly, he would not have sent his children to the village school. Like he was educated, um, but having a governess definitely was an indicator of status and wealth. Now, I did find online that Thomas was actually married twice. His first wife was Catherine Hannah Newman. His second wife was Mary Marshall. His first wife, Catherine, is or was the mother of his six children. So at the time, divorce did exist, but it really was not a thing that happened. So I can only imagine that perhaps Catherine passed away younger. She had six kids, so maybe that happened at that time. But this is just a small sliver of personal information I was able to find. They really kept a lot of this personal stuff under wraps and Thomas Burberry had two sons and four daughters. So by this point, Burberry was doing well. I mean, he was living on his 160 acre estate. Things were going really well. Things were going Burberry. Uh, but he understood that in order to maintain his success, he needed some sort of publicity, you know, just to continue, just to keep moving things along. And I don't know exactly how this happened, but at a point in time, there were a couple of very prominent British military leaders that started wearing Burberry. I don't know if Burberry had it sent to them or if they just discovered it or how it happened, but this really helped keep things going. These prominent British military figures were Lord Kitchener and Lord Baden Powell. So it could be that they themselves were also great outdoorsmen and liked to go fishing and hunting, um, but also maybe they just bought Burberry on their own because they knew that it had a great reputation and because they were in the military, they were always outside, you know. These two men were considered to be great war heroes. They were decorated, they were well-respected. So the fact that they were going around wearing Burberry just helped things along. And this is where we see that finally 
there are some nobility, upper class, elites, royals, etc., that start wearing Burberry because up until then, it was just the farmers and the shepherds wearing Burberry. I found out some um, information about these two British officers. So Lord Kitchener was a senior British officer and also colonial administrator. Some of his claims to fame were the scorched earth policy during the Boer Wars, or the second Boer War to be precise, and also his expansion of concentration camps during the second Boer War. Uh, the second dude, Lord Baden-Powell, was a lieutenant general in the British Army. He was the founder and first chief scout of the scout movement. It's a bit more wholesome. So with this encouragement of these famous military leaders, this helped uh, bring Burberry a little bit more worldwide recognition. It also just helped solidify him. I mean, he was already doing really well, but it was just like an endorsement, you know, these famous people cer certifying him in a way. But what's interesting is, you know, how did Burberry go from the choice gar garment for the rugged outdoorsman to something that everyone wears? You know, like when I think of Burberry, I do think of luxury, I think high class, I think very nice, very fancy. So how did it go from, you know, dressing fishermen to something on luxury street like how did that happen well let me tell you so as i said uh thomas was always trying to innovate trying to create new fabrics new materials you know just to help out his rugged outdoorsmen and this led him to experiment thomas came up with this material this fabric called gabardine what is that? It's a very tightly woven material that's lightweight, it's flexible, it's also breathable, and most importantly, it is waterproof. Yeah, he invented waterproof. How cool is that? Before the invention of gabardine, when someone wanted something waterproof, it had a rubberized uh, component, so basically, you were wearing a giant coat made out of rubber. Can you imagine how uncomfortable, how not breathable, and how stiff it would be to do any sort of outdoor work and labor? If you're wearing something made out of rubber, it would be waterproof, but at what cost? So Thomas set out to create this fabric. He kept exper experimenting and he eventually invented gabardine, which was waterproof. It was exactly what everyone wanted, waterproof, but also movable, not stiff and breathable. So he invented gabardine. This was incredibly revolutionary. I mean, it just revolutionized everyone's life who worked outside. If you had to be outside in the elements, if you needed some sort of like weatherproof garment, this was life-changing. I mean, think of the iPhone. When the iPhone came out, I mean, there's life before an iPhone and life after an iPhone. And this was basically what gabardine was like for a lot of people because it just changed things so dramatically. By 1888, Thomas was able to get a patent on uh, gabardine. So gabardine, or Burberry gabardine was just like the talk of the town, the greatest, hottest new invention. It was wonderful. And by this point, one of his sons, Arthur, started working with him as well. And Arthur helped open the now flagship Burberry location in Haymarket, London. This is the flagship location now, but at the time, it was just an expansion on the brand. He was getting lots of positive press, um, you know, from those military heroes wearing it. He was getting lots of great press in newspapers, in magazines, and this is when he started dressing more fancy pants people, not just the laborers who needed a, a waterproof a coat. And something interesting that I found in my research is that in 1891, when they had the Haymarket London location, very chic, they said that their one of their best selling items was something called a walking Burberry. I don't know what that means. I, I think they're referring to an umbrella. 
because it stated that by 1891, one of their top selling items was something called a walking Burberry. I couldn't really figure out what that is, but I think it's an umbrella. I mean, if they had the patent on the weather or waterproof fabric and you had an umbrella that was totally waterproof, to me that makes sense. And also because it was lightweight, it wasn't heavy, it wasn't rubber. So I think they're referring to like a walking waterproof umbrella. I think that's what it is, but please feel free to correct me down in the comments because I wasn't really able to figure it out. But uh, later in 1901, they actually had a public a nationwide competition to come out with a logo because they didn't have a logo yet for Burberry and so they just had a competition just to have um, entries actually it's quite clever it's very good marketing to just get people interested in the brand and so the entry that won was this design of like a 13th or 14th century knight and so this is still currently the Burberry logo. So one of the most interesting parts of Burberry history personally is that Burberry was also really linked closely to a lot of the famous British um, and European explorers and adventurers because at this time there was a lot of exploration, adventure, etc. And a lot of the famous adventurers and explorers at this time wore the waterproof, weatherproof uh, Burberry gabardine. In 1893, Norwegian explorer, Nobel Peace Prize laureate and zoologist Fridtjof Nelson became the very first person to use a Burberry gabardine coat on his trip to the Arctic Circle. In 1910, pioneer of avi aviation Claude Graham White became the first person to fly between London and Manchester within less than 24 hours and he was wearing Burberry. In 1911, a, another Norwegian explorer, uh, Roald Amundsen, famously a key figure in the exploration of the Antarctic, uh, led a team and they were the first people to reach the South Pole. Guess who they were wearing? Burberry. Burberry Gabberdy, to be exact, because they needed that waterproof, weatherproof aspect. You know when there is a, a red carpet, like at the Oscars, Golden Globes, and everyone is walking down, and the reporters are always like, who are you wearing tonight? Who are you wearing? I would love to go back in time with like a camera crew and a microphone as these men are struggling through the Antarctic and being like, excuse me, sir, who are you wearing today? Burberry? Fascinating. I just love that. Now, there was a little bit of tragedy about around this time relating to uh, these famous explorers. In 1912, uh, British explorer Captain Robert Falcon Scott. What a name. Captain Robert Falcon Scott. Okay. He uh, led a team to the South Pole. They were wearing Burberry, of course. Uh, but unfortunately, they did not make it back. You know... I think if you become an explorer, you kind of know that there's some risks if you're exploring at the time parts that, you know, people didn't really go to that much. And what's interesting is they were wearing Burberry coats, but they were also wearing uh, or using Burberry tents. The gabardine fabric was made for clothing, but they would also use it to make tents. So when they would set up camp, you know, on the Antarctic somewhere, they would actually have tents made out of Burberry gabardine as well. I think the most famous explorer, or the person that I know the most, is a Anglo-Irish Antarctic explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton. So he was also a key figure in the exploration of the Antarctic continent and he wore Burberry a total of three times across his expeditions on the Antarctic. And then we also have the British mountaineer George Mallory, who wore a Burberry gabardine jacket on his, I think his first attempt at Mount Everest in 1924. So remember those British officers that we mentioned before, some with questionable um, claims to fame? Anyway, uh, that really came into play because in 1900, the British War Office approached Burberry and asked them to design military uniforms. I mean, may as well. You know, they're dressing people to go survive the Antarctic mostly, so why not dress British soldiers too? At the time, a lot of the British uh, soldiers were wearing items that were like, had that rubberized fabric, so like super heavy, super bulky, not really great for movement, and so they wanted that gabardine you know, that Burberry gabardine. And so Thomas started working on that. He was working on this coat 
that could be weatherproof, waterproof, uh, lightweight, flexible, offer lots of movement, but it also had to be very functional because these, these were soldiers, you know, they were going off to war, fighting in the trenches, etc. So it needed to have, you know, freedom of movement, not too many bells and whistles, not too many buttons and clasps, maybe a couple epaulettes, you know, just to like attach something like come off and on so you could attach something here very functional and practical so the first design that came out was actually called a it's a jacket or was a jacket called the tie lock-in jacket that doesn't say much but we have some photos of it and so this was some of the like first designs for this type of coat and this came into play uh, during the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. So British soldiers wore, the, wore these jackets in the trenches. So it was lightweight, waterproof, you know, as they were struggling in the mud and the water. And, you know, it was still lightweight and it was still offered some movement as they were fighting in the trenches. What's interesting is this jacket was designed for the military, but after the First World War, it became popular with civilians because Burberry was initially a brand for civilians, for everyday people. And so people liked this, the design, it liked, they liked the functionality of the tie lock-in jacket. So they started actually selling this model or versions of it to civilian population between the wars. Now, does anyone want to guess what this jacket is called today? Originally, the tie lock-in, the soldiers wore it in the trenches. The trench coat! Burberry invented the trench coat. They invented waterproofing, they invented the trench coat. Fascinating, yeah, the trench coat. I mean, they were fighting in the trenches. Duh, it took me so long to figure it out. I was like, wow, that makes sense. I love a trench coat. I think it looks so timeless, chic, elegant. I think you could find a trench coat that came out like, 30 years ago and it would still look just as good today. Like they just look so good. So yeah, he invented the trench coat. I think that is so fascinating that the trench coat was designed for the military and then people were like, actually, that's kind of nice. Can you make me one too, please? They're kind of cute. So they go from being part of like British military uniforms to civilian fashion. Love that. And also between the wars, it wasn't just the uh, British military that started using the trench coat, also the American military started using the trench coat because, you know, it was just a really great jacket. So at this point in time, Thomas Burberry received an award, an accolade from King George V of Britain. He received the Royal Warrant of Taylor. So he was the tailor of the king. Okay, very fancy. In 1919, Captain John Alcock and Lieutenant Arthur Witten Brown wore Burberry aviator suits in an exposed cockpit and completed the first non-stop transatlantic flight in 72 hours. Thankfully, transatlantic flights are shorter now, but this was the first one and they did so wearing Burberry. So I think we need to take a little moment to just appreciate the trench coat in fashion history because I could do an entire video on just the trench coat. I actually wanna take just a little detour here and talk about important cinematic moments in history and the trench coat because this jacket has been represented across media in so many different ways, in so many different iconic movies, iconic scenes, Let's just take a moment to appreciate it. We have Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca. We have Marlena Dietrich in A Foreign Affair. Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Peter Sellers in the Pink Panther movies. Paul Newman and Julie Andrews in Torn Curtain. Paul Newman again in Paris Blues. More modern representations of the trench coat in media are also seen with Kerry Washington in A Scandal, Brad Pitt and Matt Damon in Ocean's Eleven or Ocean's Twelve, Barbara Streisand and Robert Redford in The Way We Were, Meryl Streep in Kramer vs. Kramer, and Dale Hannah in Kill Bill, just to name a few. I mean, if you want to play a game of spot the trench coat, when you watch TV, when you watch movies, the trench coat is everywhere. 
so i just thought that was fascinating i took a little i had too much bronzer but i took a little detour there because i just thought that was so interesting like how fascinating is that to invent something that then becomes so iconic how fabulous i did skip around the decades there a little bit just to you know highlight the fabulous fashionable trench coat and there were a few women in like the 30s and 40s that really helped make the trench coat chic and glamorous and elegant women like Greta Garbo, Gloria Swanson, Betty Davis really helped make this iconic universal and also unisex because they took it from being like you know, a men's military outfit to something that you'd wear to go out. It was in the 1930s that Burberry started focusing on making women's trench coats and really capitalizing on that market. And it was really in the 1940s that it was truly cemented in fashion history with the, men with the film I mentioned earlier, Casablanca. Uh, according to the American Film Institute, this film is ranked as number two as the greatest film of all time. I don't know what the number one is, probably Citizen Kane, but it's just to highlight the impact and significance of this Thai lock-in jacket. So after the First World War in 1920, very subtly, Burberry introduced their Haymarket check. This is the famous check that you're used to seeing, the logo of the brand. It didn't start off with it right away, it just sort of it's something that they just introduced in the 1920s and they started, um, they introduced it actually by lining the inside of the trench coat. So it was very subtle. It wasn't like a huge promotion. It just sort of, you know, crept on the market overnight. Today, we know the Haymarket check as Burberry, like right away, we know what it is, but that wasn't always the case. And in 1917, Thomas Burberry retired. He led a very, um, successful career so he decided to you know take a chill go back to his estate with 160 acres he was a humanitarian he was also really big into health and sport like that's why he started the brand for people who are outdoors because he was an avid outdoorsman himself he believed in going outside and nature and walking and you know being active he led, led a pretty good life he also was a teetotaler so he did not drink any alcohol and he also was against the use of tobacco. Thomas passed away peacefully in 1926 at the age of 90. So I guess, you know, not drinking, not smoking and being in the outdoors helped him live a pretty healthy, long life. It's always sad when someone passes away, but when someone passes away at the age of 90, it's like, it's still sad, but it's like, okay, well, they lived like a very full, life they lived life to the fullest and in 1934 burberry introduced same day delivery in london so sort of like uber eats but with um, waterproof jackets and i don't have lots of information about the rest of his family like i just know that arthur helped open the haymarket london location this family was really not interested in being famous whatsoever like not everyone wants to be a kardashian which makes sense um, but let's just keep talking about the Burberry brand here for a second. So uh, during the outbreak of the Second World War, Burberry uh, dressed, like did the uniforms not only for the British military, but also for the Royal British Air Force, for the Royal Navy. They also um, did uniforms for the women's divisions as well. And even though uh, in the UK at the time during the Second World War, there were a lot of very austere conditions, you know, it was not a great time for a lot of British people, the company itself still was able to maintain itself and make profit. And they were dressing everyone, you know, they were ma making functional clothing. They weren't making fancy over the top clothing. They were making clothing that you needed to work and to survive. So it makes sense that they were actually able to maintain profits during the war. Something that Burberry invented at this time was the women's siren suits. So at the time, uh, Germans would fly over and they would bomb the daylights out of England, specifically London, but other parts as well. And so when the giant German planes would come over, these huge sirens would sound and people would run they would turn off the lights specifically because the raids typically happened at night and so you had to turn off every light turn off the radio you know just hide and just try to find some shelter underground people would 
if they had a basement, they would go to the basement. They would go also to the London underground, like the tunnels, just to basically avoid bombings. And so they invented this woman's siren suit. So when you'd hear the siren, it was basically just like a jumpsuit. You would just jump into it and zip up. And it had a hood as well. This basically was like, listen, let's say the siren goes off and you're gonna be stuck underground in a tunnel all night. You can wear the suit and it's, it keeps you warm. So instead of just being like in your dress and your skirt, you put on the suit over top of everything you're wearing and then you have your hood and you just like sit there in the tunnel waiting for the siren to stop. Then in 1955, Burberry received a royal warrant as weatherproofer to the queen. So Queen Elizabeth, he was, um, or Burberry itself, was the official weatherproof maker for the queen. When I do think of the queen, I do think of her as very, you know, in nature with a little headscarf, rubber boots, you know, stomping around the Scottish Highlands. You know, I think she enjoys nature, being outside. So it makes sense that she would want Burberry to officially dress her in weatherproof clothing. In 1964, Burberry became the official outerwear supplier for the women's Olympic team in Tokyo of that year. So in 1967, something very interesting happened. So there was a buyer for Burberry, uh, Jacqueline Dillman, and she was in the Paris store and she was doing a fashion presentation for the British ambassador at the time, Sir Patrick Riley. And she had this like burst of inspiration. So she had Burberry coats, so she took the lining with the Haymarket check and she ripped it off and she took the Haymarket check and, and wrapped it around suitcases, luggage, small other goods, etc. And she basically invented the Burberry accessory because when you think of Burberry accessories now, you do think of that Haymarket check. And so it just sort of came as a flash of inspiration for this employee of Burberry. Now, when I was doing research on this uh, family, on the company, I wasn't able to find a huge family tree like I did with Guerlain, with Gucci. It really seems that, you know, Thomas set things in motion. He really got things going and he clearly did work with his sons as well. But I don't really have a family history, family tree for the different generations, like so-and-so went to so-and-so and so-and-so went to so-and-so. I don't really have that. It really seems like this family had like no interest in being famous whatsoever, like really just doing their craft and just like, working behind the scenes, which makes sense because, you know, I think when you associate one single person with the brand, you know, if it goes from one generation to the next and then they highlight this person as like in charge, if that person does or says something stupid or racist, it, you know, it's a bad mark on the company. So it makes sense for things to be a bit more subtle and just like behind the scenes. So when I was researching Burberry, I came across some very interesting information and I need your help. So you know how everything that is new becomes old, etc. you know, like it just goes away, comes back. I learned that at some point in the 90s and 2000s, Burberry took a dip. It somehow became not that classy, but it kind of seems like a classist thing. So they just took a dip in popularity in the 90s and 2000s, and it seems that it was connected to a lot of British football fans. Um, there were a lot of football fans at the time who would wear Burberry accessories, and a lot of them, or there just were a lot of CCTV photos of football fanatics, whether their team won or lost, rioting in the streets. And unfortunately, they were caught on camera rioting wearing Burberry. And so there was this association with like football hooligans and Burberry at some point. And I think it kind of had like a classist undertone. And there were some restaurants, bars, hotels, whatever, who would refuse entry to people if they were wearing Burberry. I personally have zero recollection of this. I mean, I was really young in the 90s and 2000s, like beginning of 2000s, and I did not live in the UK. So I don't remember this at all. But if you're older than me, if you remember this, if you live in the UK now, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Cause like, this was just something that I learned that I had no clue, like I had no idea. And I also heard some theories that maybe the dip in Burberry at that time was also because of the logo mania happening and maybe that Haymarket check everywhere was just like 
not that attractive to people but also like right now there's a lot of logo mania like a lot of brands that like want you to know from 10 miles away what their brand is which i don't you know particularly enjoy but the dip went up and it's back up again uh uh burberry was valued at 5.2 billion dollars so like they're fine and even though i don't have like a full family tree to dissect I can assure you that if your great-grandfather invented Burberry, you're probably fine. You're fine. It wasn't until 1981 that Burberry introduced their perfume collection, and they actually started off with a men's cologne first. A few years later, they started with women's, and I think that uh, Burberry colognes and perfumes are very well placed on the market. They are definitely perfumes that I know of. I don't think I own any Burberry perfumes, actually, but they are very popular. Um, something interesting too, in 2010, Burberry came out with a cosmetics line, a beauty line, but I personally haven't tried any Burberry makeup yet. I don't have access to it. There's no Burberry counter here. I could order from Harrods or Selfridges probably, but it's just not a brand that's very accessible. I would love to try Burberry cosmetics. I also, I kind of think think they need a revamp the same way that Gucci Beauty did because Gucci Beauty had a makeup line like 10 years ago that no one heard of but then they did this entire 180 a total makeover and Gucci Beauty is Gucci Beauty now so I think Burberry needs that they need to do something because it's not really I don't know it could be better I would love to try Burberry Beauty I just need it to be accessible and something I want to share with you I found this adorable little short film. It's like three minutes long. I thought it was a trailer for a movie, but it was actually produced by Burberry. And it's a dramatic and romanticized tale of events. It's basically the life story of Thomas Burberry and a lot of the things that we talked about today, but in a dramatic, very high budget three minute movie. It's really worth watching. I really enjoyed it. Play a game of trying to name every single British actor in the movie. I dare you, there are so many. It's really fun, it's a really great movie. It, I mean, I thought it was a trailer. I was like, when is this movie coming out? Because it looks like a trailer, but it's just like Burberry made this type of thing. And like, it gives you this strange pride for Burberry for some reason. Anyway, uh, I will include that somewhere in the comment section down below for you. But anyway, this is it for beauty history on Thomas Burberry on the Burberry brand. Wow, what a ride, waterproof trench coats, so much. I liked all the explorers too. Whenever I do a little bit of like precursory research, the thing that hooks me is when I find like random little tidbits of information. I'm like, ooh, that's interesting. So let me know what was the most interesting or surprising part of today's episode. Also leave a comment and tell me who I should research next. And I think that's it for today's video. So thank you all so much for stopping by. Hope you have a beautiful day and I'll see you next time. Bye.